Hello, I am Hearing Officer Dr. Linda Valentini. In the session that follows, I will provide information about special education due process covering a wide range of topics. I've been a hearing officer for over 20 years, and in those 20 years, I've presided over several thousand cases and have held hearings on several hundred of those cases. I am a clinical psychologist by training, and I also hold school psychologist certification in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I worked in the mental health field for years before starting my work as a hearing officer. My late husband was an elementary school principal in Philadelphia, and I add that to my credentials, albeit secondhand, since he often spoke with fondness and frustration about his work. The Office for Dispute Resolution is creating a series of podcasts for stakeholders on a variety of topics regarding special education dispute resolution. I have recorded a podcast directed primarily to parents. This podcast is primarily directed towards special education supervisors and other representatives of local education agencies, LEAs. Whether the setting is a school district, an intermediate unit, or a charter school, although regardless of target audience, we believe there is valuable information for all. The research is clear that when parents and educators work collaboratively together, children learn. As educational professionals, your chosen careers are directed towards the quality education of the children you serve and I know that it is important for you to provide each child with an appropriate education. The thing to remember is that each child's education is a partnership between yourself and the child's parents. And while you are the education experts, the parents are experts about their children. As the educators, you have the final say about a child's program and placement. But from meeting hundreds of you, I know that you value parents' participation and input and give it serious consideration. One way to promote valuable parental participation is to make sure that parents understand the special education process as thoroughly as possible. This means that at meetings or in correspondence, as it seems necessary, you explain terms, explain IEP components, and answer any questions the parents have. It is important to check for parents' understanding. As I'm certain you know, sometimes parents, especially those new to special education, are overwhelmed by the whole process and may not even know what questions to ask. Think back to your very first position as a special education director or LEA representative. I'll bet that you had dozens of questions, at least about what you knew to ask, let alone all the other questions that arose as time went on. There may have been times when you were overwhelmed by what you didn't know yet. I think that looking back, you can slip very comfortably into a parent's shoes. Recently, a clearly dedicated, newly appointed special education director remarked after a due process hearing, that she had learned a great deal during the process, not only about what she has to do, but why she has to do it. For many of you, what I will be addressing is not novel information, but my hope is that whether as a refresher or as new material, it will be of help in your important work. A child's IEP is a legal contract for the child's education. So as with parents, all LEA staff who relate directly with the child need to be able to read the IEP and to understand it. One thing that school staff and parents should always be sure of is that the IEP and related services in it are being implemented. It is very important that parents and the LEA ensure that a child is getting the services that are in that educational contract that the IEP team created. Keep lines of communication open and encourage school staff to bring concerns they may have about a child to the school team and to the parents, and to do this earlier rather than later. Frequently, concerns left unaddressed by school staff and or by parents do not just go away. They grow larger, 
And when this happens, things can get heated up to the point where everyone's energy goes into being angry. Make time for school staff and parents to discuss their concerns with you, either at the time they ask or at a time that's good for you both. When there has been a face-to-face -face conversation or a telephone conversation with parents, it's a good idea to summarize that conversation in a follow-up email because when people are anxious or worried, memory may not serve too well. So that everybody's on the same page, you can write, for example, we discussed X, Y, and Z. My understanding is this. Tell me if this is your understanding as well. This way you have checked and made sure that the parties are on the same page. If time and scheduling permit, an informal meeting with parents is a good way to address concerns when they arise. Hopefully at that meeting, the parents' concerns and questions can be addressed to everyone's satisfaction and the child's benefit. It's always a good idea to take notes at the meeting and, as I said before, follow up with a verification email. If after an informal meeting you and the parents still have not resolved concerns, then reconvene the IEP team. As you know, the IEP meeting is a formal meeting where you and the parents can discuss concerns that you both may have and where the team can make appropriate revisions to a child's educational contract if needed. At times, although the team may ordinarily be friendly and working together for the child's best interest, you or the parents may feel that an upcoming IEP meeting will be difficult and may get pretty tense. If you and or the parents anticipate that this will be the case, there is help if both sides agree. The Office for Dispute Resolution in Harrisburg, ODR, offers what's called IEP meeting facilitation. That is, ODR would send someone to your location to sit in on the IEP meeting and help the IEP team communicate as well as possible. The IEP facilitator will not write the IEP or take sides, but will help the parties with the IEP meeting process. One thing that parents may not understand that is difficult for parents to understand is that what the law guarantees a child is an appropriate education. Appropriate does not mean ideal. Appropriate does not mean the best in all possible worlds. Sometimes appropriate doesn't even mean better than something else. Appropriate asks if the child's goals and interventions address the child's needs in a way that is designed to provide meaningful educational benefit in light of the child's circumstances. If after an informal meeting and an IEP meeting and then possibly a facilitated IEP meeting, a parent believes that things are still not going well, the parent might be considering asking for mediation or a due process hearing. Mediation is a voluntary process which both parties must agree to use, and it is an excellent way to work on resolving disputes. There is information about mediation on ODR's website, so I'm going to focus on what I know, and that is due process. If parents believe a due process hearing is necessary, they will request it by filing a complaint which constitutes the due process hearing request. This complaint must go to the LEA as well as to ODR. Within a day or so, sometimes the same day, a hearing officer will be assigned. The hearing officer is an outside person, an objective person, an unbiased person who will give you and the parents a decision about the issue or issues that you're having a dispute about. But keep in mind that as important a procedural safeguard due process is for parents, it is always best for the LEA and the parents to resolve issues without having to litigate. Litigation is difficult for everyone. Sometimes, particularly in smaller settings, LEA staff feel hurt or embarrassed when they receive a due process complaint filed by a parent or an attorney for a parent. Please try not to be either. Due process is very common in many states, and Pennsylvania is one of the states with the highest rate of hearing requests. I remember when I got into my first fender bender, I felt embarrassed. 
It seemed as though I had a big red BD for bad driver on my forehead. Providing special education to a child is a complex process, and sometimes even when LEAs act in good faith, they make mistakes or are perceived as having made mistakes. This is, in most cases, not a personal failure on your part. Sometimes complaints come out of the blue, and sometimes parents will disclose beforehand that they want a hearing. Receiving a due process complaint is never an enjoyable experience, especially if this is your first one. Be reassured because an experienced special education attorney will be assigned to handle the case with you. LEAs are required to have attorneys represent them, but parents may represent themselves or be pro se. A good way to prepare yourself for the experience of a due process hearing is to go on the website of the Office for Dispute Resolution and look at some hearing officer decisions. All the decisions the hearing officers have rendered over the past many years are on the web. They are searchable by the name of the hearing officer, by the school district or the intermediate unit or the charter school, and by the issue that the hearing addressed. If the hearing addressed more than one issue, the decision will pop up in more than one place. It's a good idea to get a sense of how hearing officers have decided issues similar to the issues in the complaint you have received by reading the decisions that are out there. Aside from its being a requirement, there are advantages to having a special education attorney work with you in a case. The advantages to having attorneys, and I'm not an attorney, so I'm not drumming up business for colleagues, the advantages to having an attorney are that they have a great deal of experience, they understand the meaning of the federal laws and the state laws, and they have relationships with parent attorneys with whom they have worked together in the past to resolve cases as well as to go to hearings. Your attorney will be vigorous in presenting your case, but your attorney will also first try to amicably and fairly settle the case rather than having you have to go to hearing. By the way, in Pennsylvania, well over half of the hearing requests filed never get to an actual hearing. That very high settlement rate is in part due to the good working relationship of the special education attorneys on both sides, as well as to the resolution meeting that parents and their schools must have when parents file the hearing request, which I will touch on later. Your attorney will also give you an idea about the chances of your being able to prevail. The most gain in having an attorney is less emotional wear and tear on you, because believe me, sitting in a hearing is difficult, and the distress and the anxiety that both sides, school staff as well as parents, experience can be intense. Hearings are not a piece of cake. They're not fun for anybody, including the hearing officer. Hearings are litigation, and litigation is fighting. If you have an attorney do that for you, it certainly makes it easier for you. As I noted previously, parents may represent themselves, and parents who represent themselves can win in a due process hearing. The other hearing officers and I have had cases over the years with parents who represented themselves and have prevailed. However, it is true that the whole due process process goes much more smoothly when both parties are represented by counsel. Within the first 15 calendar days of receiving the parent's complaint, the LEA must convene a resolution meeting. By law, the LEA must convene the meeting and parents must go to the resolution meeting and participate, unless both parties decide to waive the resolution meeting and inform the hearing officer of this in writing. I firmly discourage LEAs and parents from waiving the resolution meeting because it is a valuable tool toward helping the parties get back on the same page. Sometimes parents say, I've been talking to the school district all these many weeks. I've been fighting with the school district at IEP meetings and things haven't changed. Nevertheless, I advise parents strongly that they need to go to the resolution meeting because one, the law requires it, and two, once parents have filed for a hearing, they and the LEA are on a different footing 
and there is more incentive to work together to resolve the issue. Sometimes the resolution meeting is the place where the problems that the parties are concerned about are resolved. If in fact parents decide not to come to a resolution meeting, it is the right of the attorney for the LEA to ask the hearing officer to dismiss the complaint. After the 15-day period in which there must be a resolution meeting, there is an additional 15 days for the parties to try to work things out. Meanwhile, very shortly after parents file for the hearing, usually that same day, a hearing officer will be assigned and will set a hearing date anywhere from day 31 after the filing date to about day 45 or 50, unless the parties have waived the resolution meeting, in which case the hearing date must be earlier. The decision due date, or DDD, is the 75th day starting with day one, the day the complaint was filed, unless the resolution meeting has been waived. If absolutely necessary, either side can ask for some additional time to prepare for the hearing or can ask for a postponement, also called a continuance, for reasons such as a prepaid vacation, a pre-planned medical procedure, a school holiday, or the like. If you need a date change, your attorney must email the hearing officer, copy the attorney for the parents or the parents if they are pro se, and explain exactly why you need a date change. However, you must keep the decision due date in mind when you ask for a postponement. Extension of DDDs can be granted by the hearing officer at the request of either party, only for good cause. All correspondence from the hearing officer and from the attorney for the parents will go through your attorney. Nothing will go directly to you. If the parents don't have an attorney, then the hearing officer will send correspondence directly to the parents and to your attorney. As the LEA, you must set up the resolution meeting quickly, and you may contact the parents directly about scheduling that meeting, even if they have an attorney. You do not have to copy the hearing officer on that email. Email is ODR's default method of correspondence. The hearing officer will provide clear directions to your attorney about how to prepare any documents he or she needs to present your case and what the hearing officer's expectations are in terms of procedures. You should not contact the hearing officer directly for any reason and the hearing officer will not contact you directly. All correspondence will go through your attorney. However, your attorney and the parent's attorney can and should communicate with one another without involving the hearing officer, and your attorney can contact pro se parents. By the way, hearing officers can give parents who are representing themselves some information on procedural matters, requesting subpoenas, for example, or marking documents. But the hearing officers cannot communicate with them or your attorney about the merits of the party's positions in the case. If you know that a parent is pro se, you may want to advise him or her that ODR offers consultation to parents who represent themselves in due process and can walk them through the procedural steps they need to take in order to take part appropriately in the hearing. Again, ODR personnel cannot give anyone any advice about their case in particular and certainly can't give legal advice but can answer all the technical questions that pop up in terms of procedures and what will happen at the hearing and how the hearing will go and other important things that pro se parents need to know. Hearings go much more smoothly for everyone when pro se parents are well prepared. I am talking about permissions to evaluate, evaluation and reevaluation reports, IEPs, NOREPs, IEP progress monitoring and related raw data, report cards, compilations of data on tests, quizzes, homework, and class participation, attendance records, discipline records, nursing notes, counseling notes, related services providers' notes, and emails. If you're thinking to yourself, okay, but what about X? The answer is yes. If you have any doubt whatsoever, send it to your attorney and he or she will deal with it. 
I tell attorneys as well as pro se parents to please limit the number of witnesses they're going to call to testify. My colleagues and I don't want to hear the same thing from six different people. If someone testifies credibly to a particular fact, then that's all you need. We also don't want repetitive testimony or testimony that's not relevant to the case. Your attorney will work with you when he or she is preparing your case. It is very important that you listen to your attorney. I repeat, listen to your attorney. Although they have not been on the day-to-day -day work with the child, they know special education law and the due process structure inside out. The hearing is not a place to air parties' grievances that have accumulated over time. The hearing is a place to get a specific issue or situation resolved with a person who is an independent, unbiased person with a great deal of experience in special education law, not a person who will be listening to information that is not directly related to the hearing issues. Sometimes parents who are pro se want to call a witness who is or was working for your program, perhaps the child's teacher or the speech pathologist or the psychologist who tested your child. If this is the case, your attorney will ascertain if the witness will be there voluntarily or as could be the case with persons no longer employed in the LEA if the witness requires a subpoena. When your attorney knows that a current staff member will be testifying, he or she will let you know the approximate time so that you can arrange for a substitute. As the LEA representative, you will be present for the entire hearing, as will the parent or parents. Other witnesses may be called in when it's their turn to testify. It sometimes happens that when parents file a request for due process and do not provide enough information on the complaint form, for example, the issues, the facts around the issues, and what the filer wants the hearing officer to order, the LEA attorney may send the hearing officer with a copy to the parents what is called a sufficiency challenge. Within five days of receiving the sufficiency challenge, the hearing officer must decide whether, in fact, the parent's complaint meets the requirements of the IDEA. If the hearing officer finds that the complaint is not sufficient, the parents will be given the opportunity to amend or revise the complaint and refile it. When an amended complaint is filed, the timelines start over, and the day the amended complaint is filed becomes day one. The LEA must convene another resolution meeting because there will be new information to consider. Okay, so the hearing day has arrived and you are ready for the hearing. Unless the issue is not complicated, plan on the possibility of two full hearing days and perhaps more. Sometimes school staff and parents are surprised because they're used to IEP meetings taking one or two hours. The hearing is very different from an IEP meeting. It is a formal process that can very well take a whole day or more. All participants should always plan for childcare at the end of the day because the hearing may not end at 3 p.m. or even at 5 p.m. It's a good idea to bring water and pack a lunch in case you need it. Let the hearing officer know if you have any situation that would require regularly timed breaks or the possible need to answer an urgent phone call or other factors affecting the flow of the day. At the hearing, there's the hearing officer, the court reporter taking down everything that is said, the director of special education or other LEA representative, the attorney for the LEA, the parent or parents, the child if appropriate, the parent's attorney if there is one, and witnesses for both sides. Parents may also invite friends or observers for support with the understanding that they cannot participate in the hearing. Only parents can choose whether the hearing will be open or closed. In an open hearing, anyone from the public may attend and the decision with the child's name on it could be released upon request of an interested party. In a closed hearing, only the persons I mentioned just now may be present and the decision in its original form may only be released to the parties to the hearing and anyone who has to implement the decision. 
All witnesses are asked to swear or affirm that they will tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Parents who are witnesses in their own due process hearings will also be sworn in. Sometimes hearing officers will swear in a pro se parent from the beginning of the hearing. After very brief opening statements from each side, each side will then present witnesses and may include documents called exhibits while presenting witnesses. When the LEA presents witnesses, the parent's attorney or the pro se parent will have an opportunity to question those witnesses. Also, after the witnesses for the parents are questioned by the parent's attorney or the pro se parent, then your attorney will have an opportunity to question those witnesses. Usually, when parents represent themselves, they are permitted to testify in narrative format rather than in a question and answer method. When you testify, either during questioning by your attorney or by the parent's attorney or pro se parent, tell the hearing officer what he or she needs to know and understand about your position on the issue. During the hearing, be respectful of the process. Listen to the hearing officer. Remain centered and calm. Avoid sarcasm. It is not helpful at all, and it presents a witness in a bad light. Just be frank and honest. Tell the hearing officer about your position as clearly as you can. I want to say a word about the opposing attorney, the attorney representing the parents. The attorney for the parents is doing his or her job, okay? They're going to ask questions of you and your witnesses, and sometimes the questions will seem hard, and sometimes they may seem on the verge of being hostile. They are just doing their job. When I treated children who were sexually abused, I would sometimes prepare them to testify in court. And one of the things I would tell them is, look, the guy that did this to you has a lawyer, and the lawyer's job is to get the judge or the jury not to believe the guy did it. I would tell them that to make people believe the guy and not believe them, that lawyer will look at you with mean eyes. He will frown at you. But you know what happened, and you just tell the truth how you remember the truth. I would say the same thing to anybody who's a witness in a due process hearing, whether it is the parent or school personnel. The opposing attorney is doing his or her job, so understand that and just take it as part of the process. You have to remember that a due process hearing is litigation, and litigation means fighting. In a hearing, the fighting is polite and civilized and sometimes even cordial but it is still fighting to have the hearing officer see it your way in accord with the law. The party that files for the hearing is the side that has the burden of proof. That means that if the parents filed for the hearing, they have to prove their case. The standard for proof is which side has the more evidence that is credible. If both sides are equally credible and exactly balanced, then the party asking for the hearing cannot win because they didn't have more evidence than the other side. This equal balance virtually never happens. Maybe in 20 years, two or three times, I said, well, on one hand, but on the other hand, it's 50-50, and there's just no way to break the tie. Hearing officers judge the credibility of each witness. That is, does the hearing officer believe the witness, and if so, why, and if no, why not? If you read decisions on the ODR website, you will read the hearing officer's comments about credibility of witnesses. Hearing officers will often find witnesses to be credible about the facts presented, although sometimes there are some memory issues. The hearing officers will understand that memory issues do arise and that may or may not impact on the credibility of a witness. After all the witnesses have testified, the hearing officer will allow the parties to give brief oral closing summaries of their cases or to give written closing statements if the parties both decide they wish to do this. Once the hearing officer has heard all the evidence and has looked at all the exhibits and considered the closing statements, then he or she will write a decision that will be issued on or before the decision due date. Decisions tend to be pretty long, 15 to 20 or even 30 or more pages. The hearing officer will send it by email to your attorney and to the attorney from the opposing side or the parents if they've represented themselves.
The hearing officer will also send a copy of what are called the appeals procedures to the parties. A party who is in disagreement with the hearing officer's decision is perfectly welcome to appeal that decision to a court of competent jurisdiction, the federal court or the commonwealth court. So if you get a decision and you and your attorney believe the hearing officer is wrong, your attorney may file for an appeal and a judge will review the decision and the court reporter's transcript and the exhibits and decide whether the hearing officer was right or wrong about the law. Sometimes hearing officers are told by the judge, you know, we don't agree with you because you made a mistake in the facts juxtaposed with the law. We hearing officers all get used to being reversed on appeal once in a while, although more often than not, the judge will find that the hearing officer did correctly decide the case. I have been talking about hearings where parents make the hearing request. There are also times when an LEA files for a hearing. As is the case when parents file for a hearing, in order for an LEA to have a hearing, your attorney must file the complaint. Your attorney will be sure that if the LEA is filing the complaint, he or she answers all the questions that are on the form. There are certain routine questions that have to do with the name and address of the child and the parents, the child's birth date, the child's disability, and the school the child is attending. In the next very important sections, your attorney has to explain exactly what is the issue or what are the issues about which the LEA wants to have a hearing and some factual information about those issues, as well as what resolution the LEA is seeking. Your attorney will send the complaint form to the Office for Dispute Resolution and also at the same time he or she must send a copy to the parents against whom you are filing the complaint. The day that ODR and the parents receive it is day one. It is important to know there's a big difference in timelines between hearings that are asked for by parents and hearings asked for by LEAs. When parents ask for hearings, there is that 30-day resolution period before a hearing can be scheduled and the decision is due in 75 days. But when LEAs make the request, there is no 30-day initial period, so the hearing may be scheduled much more quickly and the decision is due in 45 days. The most common occasions on which a hearing officer hears a case on a complaint from an LEA is when a parent has asked for an independent educational evaluation, an IEE. It may happen that an LEA does an evaluation and produces that evaluation report, and the parents disagree totally or in great part, and they ask the LEA to pay for an independent person to do another evaluation. What the parent is asking for is an evaluation done by an outside expert, but at public expense. Once a parent makes a request for an IEE, the LEA has two choices. The LEA can either say, okay, we will pay for an independent educational evaluation and tell you how you can go about it, or we think we've done a fine job, we've covered all the bases to explore your child's needs in order for the IEP team to create a good IEP, so we're not going to give you an independent educational evaluation at public expense. If the choice is to deny the IEE, then the LEA must ask for a hearing. Most times, parents are pretty surprised when in their email they see a request for a due process hearing that they haven't filed for, and in addition to that, a couple days later, getting the hearing notice and information from the hearing officer. It is kind of disconcerting for parents to have that happen, so you can anticipate some angry and or puzzled reactions unless you prepare the parents beforehand. I suggest that if you are denying an IEE request, you clearly communicate to the parents that by law you must file for a due process hearing to defend your denial of their request. In these cases, the LEA has the burden of proof. That is, you must prove to the hearing officer that your evaluation is appropriate under the law. And if not, the hearing officer will order an independent educational evaluation at the LEA's expense. When I speak to parents, I do caution them 
that independent educational evaluations are not second opinions and are not granted simply because the parent has lost trust in the LEA. In order to have a hearing officer rule in the parent's favor in an IEE case, the LEA must fail to show that the LEA's evaluation was appropriate, that is, that it had all the elements the IDEA says it must have. The next circumstance under which LEAs will sometimes file for a hearing is to have its proposed program and placement offer ordered by the hearing officer. This is fairly rare, but it does happen when the parties have gone around and around and cannot agree on what is an appropriate program and placement. I will now talk briefly about the kinds of issues about which parents commonly file hearing requests. Often parents will request a hearing because they believe that their child's program and placement have not been appropriate and will ask for changes and also ask for compensatory education services, which if the parent prevails, the hearing officer will order, being very specific about the amount and type of services to be given sometimes by whom, as well as a time limit by which the services must be used. Parents will also file for hearings about related services, speech services, social skills training, occupational therapy, physical therapy, transportation, one-to-one -one aids, nursing services. If the hearing officer finds in the parent's favor, he or she will order that those services be put in place or will order the amount at which already existing related services should be provided. Sometimes hearings are about Least Restrictive Environment, or LRE. LRE is the least restrictive environment appropriate for the child. For some children, all day full inclusion in general education classes with supplementary aids and services does work. For some children, it does not work. For many children, a combination of special education classes and general education classes works. LRE for the child is what's appropriate for that child at that particular time in that child's education. However, as you know, even children in, quote, full-time special education classes almost always are with general education peers for, for example, lunch, recess, sometimes special such as music and art, sometimes with an aid. Unless a child is in a specialized school, it is very rare that the child is 100% in special education classes. Another type of case that may be assigned to me deals with tuition reimbursement. Sometimes parents decide that a private school would be better for their child but want the LEA to pay for it, so they ask for a hearing to obtain tuition reimbursement from the LEA. Of course, parents have the right to decide where their child goes to school, but, and this is an important but, it doesn't automatically mean that the LEA has to pay for it. Remember what I said before in this talk, and this applies to all types of cases, the standard is appropriate, not the best in the world or everything that a loving parent would want for their child. The standard is appropriate, not ideal. And specifically in looking at a tuition reimbursement case, the hearing officer is not weighing which is better, the LEA's proposal or the parent's proposal, but rather, is what the LEA offered appropriate? That's the first question. If the LEA offers an appropriate program, in other words, a program that adequately meets the needs of the child, then the hearing officer must find in favor of the LEA. However, if the hearing officer finds that the LEA placement was not appropriate, then the hearing officer will consider the private placement to see if it is appropriate for the child. If so, the parents may receive tuition reimbursement. If not, reimbursement is denied. Sometimes parents privately place children in placements that are not appropriate to address the child's specific needs. And if so, the hearing officer will not order the LEA to pay for that program. Finally, if the LEA's program was not appropriate and the parent's program is appropriate, then the hearing officer will look at equities. That is, is there anything that has happened in the course of the relationship between the parties that would lessen or even cancel out the LEA's responsibility to reimburse tuition? 
There are two kinds of cases called expedited cases in which the hearings are handled in a much faster fashion than hearings are ordinarily handled. Hearings about children ages birth to three and extended school year ESY hearings must be done in 30 days soup to nuts. That means that the hearing must be held and the decision issued in 30 days or fewer from day one, which is the filing date. This makes sense since babies get older every day and ESY has to be decided before the summer begins. A little bit different but still expedited are disciplinary hearings that must be held in 20 school days, not calendar days, from the date of the request. And then the decision must be issued 10 school days after the hearing is concluded. And that concludes this podcast. I thank you for your time and your attention.